what's up everybody, Chad Kalick here, and welcome back to the Inner Crowded Room Podcast for episode number 115, which I want to share a story with you from 1992. I was 16 years old, and I had just heard from Laura, my now wife, then girlfriend, that she had never been to a concert before. Which blew my mind, because as a fan of live music, uh, growing up with my parents and with my brother, whenever I had the chance to go see a concert from live bands that I liked, I would always go, and uh, I loved it. I loved live music. I thought it was one of the coolest things uh, you know anybody could ever do, is just go check out a, a great band that you like. Well, at that time, I had heard that Tesla and Van Halen, were coming to Omaha, Nebraska. Now, I had never seen Van Halen live in person. I had seen a live video of them performing in New Haven, Connecticut, but I had never seen them live in person. Uh, I had seen Tesla on two different occasions, and they are mind-blowing. They were really one of those bands that didn't belong in that 80s hair metal classification. Uh, They were much too talented for that genre, but they kind of got shoved in there. Uh, just because, you know, they were around in that era and that's what bands had to look like, or so record labels thought, to be successful. So I told Laura, well, we're going to see Van Halen and Tesla. I could tell she was excited, uh, but more excited about the fact that I was excited for her and for us to go do something new. And uh, I had, you know, explained the different bands to her. She wasn't really much of a listener of Van Halen. You know, she had heard their hits, you know, who hadn't heard, you know, Jump or Panama. But remember, this was the Van Hagar era. Uh, So Sammy was singing at that time. And I'm very much a fan of Van Hagar. Uh, I I loved Sammy as the singer. Um, 5150 was one of my favorite albums of all time. Uh, Their four unlawful carnal knowledge album was incredible. Um, OB812 was amazing. So that was kind of my, you know, era of Van Halen. That's when they infiltrated my uh, inner airwaves, you know. Uh, So Laura, myself, um, my brother's good friend and my brother, you know, we all go to the Omaha Civic Auditorium. And the event started with something I had never seen before. We were actually out in the hallway, just Laura and I, because that's how it works, right? You go to the event with your brother and his friend, but I got a girl with me, right? So as soon as we get through the doors, I'm ghosting Brian. <laughs> I grab Laura and we're gone. I'm on Chad time at that point. Uh, so Laura and I are actually looking through concert t-shirts because back in the day, that was that was the big deal, right? You go to the show and you want to get that you know $70 concert t-shirt that is grossly overpriced, but it has some cool saying on it and the date and, and the tour dates, like, I'll never forget this Motley Crue tour shirt that I got. It said on the back, it said, Crew fans are the best. Fuck the rest. <laughs> and you couldn't wear it to, to school because you would have to put tape over it, over the swearing. And concert shirts were just a cool thing to collect, you know? So we're back there and we're looking at the Tesla t shirts and the Van Halen t shirts. And I'm trying to decide which one I want because. You know, Van Halen's the headliner, and I love Van Halen, but I was just a huge Tesla fan. And all the lights are are on inside the arena. And that's how you know when it's time to kind of go back to the floor, because we would get seat assignments, but forget that. We'd rush down to the floor as soon as we could. All you had to do is wait for the lights to go off, and then you could go down to the main barrier, just jump over the wall, and the floor was wide open. And that's how you see shows. You want to get to the floor, right? So, you would always wait for the lights to drop on the inside. And once the lights dropped, you knew the show was going to be starting in probably, you know, two or three minutes the band would come out or their opening sequence would come on. So, I finally decided the shirt that I want to get. And Laura and I are both standing in this ridiculously long line to get this shirt. And with the lights on inside the arena, I hear the band, Tesla, playing the beginning of their song, Modern Day Cowboy. And I am like, what 
in the hell is going on? And I tell Laura, you know, look, hold our place in line. Let me go look through the, you know, the main arena doors. And I looked through and I had never seen a band do this. Usually after, there's always an opening, opening, opening act, right? That literally nobody knows. And I actually usually try to make it there to see that band. Well, there had been a band that played first. And when they were done, you know, they staged for the next band, which was setting everything up. Well, I had never seen a band do this. Once they were set up with the lights on in the arena to shock and surprise everybody, Tesla just walked out, plugged in with all the lights on. And for the first three songs of their set, they played with full house lights on where everybody could see. It was the coolest thing I had ever seen. I ran back and grabbed Laura by her hand and just jerked her through those doors. I was like, we got to get to the front. Uh, we didn't even go to our seats. We went straight through the main doors, right past security, as everybody else was, just bum rushing it. No one stopped us. And we worked our way all the way to the front barrier, which can get crazy. If you've ever been to any of these uh, concerts with wide open floors, yeah, the floor can get really nuts. And uh, it was incredible. I had, we got to the front and basically I had put Laura in front of me and then I would stand behind her and I'd wrap my arms forward and grab the barrier so she couldn't be crushed by anybody. And we watched Tesla just absolutely kill it. I mean, it was an amazing, amazing show. And I could see on Laura's face, she was blown away by this world. I mean, she had never been to anything like it. Uh, she was having so much fun. And we're both just, you know, by the end of the concert, you can just twist your shirt and just wring sweat out of your shirt. It's so hot up there. So we get through the entire tesla concert and you know we need some air at this point so the concert's over the lights eventually did of course come down and tesla played out their full set so when they're done the lights come back on and we go and we're standing out in the hallway just uh dying to get something to drink and we're just talking about the show and our parts that we like and and i basically said to her you know are you having fun you know do you want to come to more of these and she was just like chad i'm having so much fun yes i love this this is a blast uh so we, you know, get her, get ourselves something to drink, and we went back inside, and and we're doing the puppy love stuff. I'm, you know, holding her hand, and I got my arm around her, and I'm standing behind her, and I'm reaching forward, and you know, I got my hands around her waist, and I'm, you know, uh, giving her little kisses on her neck, and it's just like all the puppy love stuff that you do. Looking back, God, that must have been horrific for people to see two young kids just in brazen puppy love for the world to see. But it was special, man. It was so cool. It was doing something with her that she had never done. And uh, I was just so excited for her to see uh, Van Halen because the crowd obviously reacts for the, the headlining band. And that takes it to the next level. You know, uh, Tesla was big at the time, but you know, certainly not bigger than Van Halen, you know. So the Van Halen concert starts, and they are just killing it, man. I mean, absolutely killing it. And the thing that I remember the most about watching Eddie Van Halen is I had never seen somebody do something so difficult and make it look so easy. I mean, if you ever watched Eddie play live, he like dances the whole time. He literally runs, skips, hops, dances. He rarely stands still. And he's doing all these like finger tappings and just this insane amount of guitar work. And what became obvious to me when watching him play is there are very few cases in life where someone finds that thing that they were born to do. Eddie Van Halen was born to play that guitar. And the magic that happens when a person becomes so fortunate, you know, for whatever reason, they stumbled upon the thing in life that they were meant to do. It's like watching a God. And I, I was, oh man, it's hard to find words for it. Like it, it hit me that hard watching him play. That I was like, this is the first time 
that I've really seen that in my life where a person was doing something they were meant to do and they clearly had more natural talent than anybody else at doing that, at playing guitar. And I even said that to Laura a couple times when I was there. I just said, I can't believe what I'm watching. Eddie Van Halen played all of that stuff live while dancing, <laughs> while running around, while jumping off, you know, boxes and speakers. And it was mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing. And it really was the first time that I had this kind of twinkling thought in my mind that wouldn't that be cool to play music for a living? Wouldn't that be cool? Because at that point, I had just started sputtering around on guitar because my older brother played, and Eddie Van Halen was Brian's inspiration. I mean, Brian was playing Eddie Van Halen's Eruption when Brian was 15 years old. I mean, Brian was playing it note perfect, Eruption. Brian was playing it when he was 15. And it was just, yeah, it was incredible to see Eddie like that. And, you know, we lost Eddie this year. And, yeah, it, it kind of felt to me when I heard that he died. I was thankful that I never met him because I've met a lot of my heroes out here living in Los Angeles and working in this industry. But a lot of the times when you meet your, quote, heroes, you're just kind of let down. What I mean by that is it's cool sometimes when you create a superhero in your mind. You know, like Eddie was a guitar playing superhero. And I never met him personally. And I think that's why that night remains so special in my mind. I just remember that night like a movie. You know, I've never met Sammy either and if I do I hope it's in you know a scenario where we could really spend time together because that's how I always wind up really enjoying meeting you know guys that are heroes of mine but that night when Eddie was done with his guitar solo which was the most I mean guys as a guitar player I know you hear this all the time people say oh Eddie was the best now listen to me Eddie plays things that are so incredibly difficult. I mean, the world's best guitar players. Look at Eddie like, Jesus, he's on another planet. As someone who plays guitar, I'm not even in the realm of the universe of what he could do. And again, he makes it look so incredibly easy. Uh, so when he was done... There's this really cool part of the show where Sammy walks out and he basically says, you know, look, I'm in a band with the greatest guitar player that's ever lived. He goes, so there's only two reasons for me to pull out a guitar when I'm near this guy, meaning he was not going to play a guitar solo. And remember, Sammy Hagar was known for being a very good guitar player, a very good guitar player. I mean, he wrote, I can't drive 55 and played all the guitar solos live and all that stuff. But Sammy said... He goes, there's only two reasons for me to pull out a guitar next to this man. One is to take a lesson, and two is to get an autograph. <laughs> and I thought, damn, man, that is that is the compliment of all compliments. Uh, so knowing that he can't play a guitar solo after Eddie just played his guitar solo, Sammy did something really cool. He talked about how he lived in Mexico, and the best thing that he can offer us is intimacy. And if we ever came to his house, what he would do is he would uh, offer us a chair. Uh, he would make a toast to us. He'd light up some weed and he'd play us some acoustic music. And it was really cool. The, the lights dropped and they brought out this like wicker couch and this side table that had tequila on it. And he pulled up a chair and he pulled up his acoustic guitar he took a deep breath, he thanked everybody for coming, and he asked if it was okay if he could play us an acoustic version of Give to Live. And in beautifully perfect, innocent puppy love, Laura and I began to make out to this incredible soundtrack of life that was gifted to us by Mr. Hagar. I still get chills thinking about it, of being 
that young and that lost in another person and just how special that is to feel that and knowing that that moment can only exist in that moment you know it's special Shortly after that, Van Halen started playing the song Right Now, and you got to see Eddie on the keyboards, which again, blew my mind. Blew my mind that someone could be this talented on guitar, and then turn around and, you know, play Right Now on the keyboards. And singing backups the whole time as well, pitch perfect. Uh, it was incredible. And 2020 took Eddie. You know, I didn't know him personally. I didn't know his family. But I know on one night in Omaha, Nebraska, the band that he created, his talent, enveloped my life, enveloped Laura and I, and gave us something special that we'll always have. So when I heard he passed away, yeah, it, it it was sad, you know? It was sad. But there's been a lot of that in 2020. You know, when we moved out to Los Angeles, you know, I wanted to see a Lakers game really bad. Because when I grew up, in the era that I watched basketball, you know, you were a fan of Magic, or you were a fan of Larry. Now, in my high school years, it became the Michael era. But I remember when I first started watching, you were a fan of Magic Johnson or you were a fan of Larry Bird. And that's how I became a Lakers fan. Now, again, like a lot of kids my age, I eventually became a Bulls fan because Michael Jordan was the Eddie Van Halen of the NBA or vice versa. He was the greatest to ever do it that I had seen. The guy that was perfectly suited for what he did, the guy that found what he was supposed to do. Uh, but I live in L.A. now. So I had heard from a lot of people that you got to see Kobe play. you got to see Kobe play. There's nothing like it. They said, you got to see Kobe play. Well, being somebody that's in the entertainment business, I don't like to go to these events unless I can get, you know, backstage or in the owner's box or front row or some scenario where I can you know, get a view unlike anything else. So we waited. We waited for a long time to find the right scenario to go see Kobe play. And finally, through Laura's work, uh, every year she has this marine science dinner where people show up and they do a fundraiser for the school. And because she teaches in Malibu, you can get some incredible items at these fundraisers. And uh, one of those items was a pair of Lakers tickets front row. And I was like, man, I want to bid on that. And I threw down a bid, I think, I think it was $300. And I thought for sure I would get outbid, but the word had gotten around that Laura, a school teacher, um, that she and her husband had bid on these tickets. So to be very cool to us, uh, and, and I was really surprised by this, that everybody was this cool because Laura is so good at what she does and because they appreciated her work so much, nobody bid against us. So we actually got the two front row Lakers tickets to go see Kobe play. And you know, what's crazy. I don't even remember who they played. I don't even remember. Uh, I'll tell you the, the two things that I do remember about the night when Laura and I first got there, we sat down and about two minutes after we sat down, everybody started booing, like incredibly loud. They were booing. And it sounded like the booing was coming directly at us. And I looked at Laura and I'm like, what is going on? Is everybody like booing us? And Laura is like, God, it feels like it. What is that? What? That's weird. And I'm like, what is going on? And then the booing stops. And then just a few seconds later, the booing starts again. And I'm like, what the hell? And I look up on the Jumbotron uh, where I see Paris Hilton. And she's getting booed like crazy. And then I recognize the guy sitting next to Paris Hilton, which is me. <laughs> so I was like, what the hell? So, yeah, I was just like one person down from her. 
And uh, that's they were booing her, not us. Um, but that night, I saw Kobe score 42 points. And like people said, it was incredible to watch him play. Uh, the speed of his game, the uh, just how dynamic you know he was. He, he could shoot from the outside. When he drove to the bucket, he was on another, just another. It's another level than everybody else. Um, but the thing about him that really blew me away was the speed. The overall, you know, he's a big guy, a big guy, and super fast. Um, a lot bigger guy than you think once you get there and see what I mean by big is just how tall and his frame and everything. He wasn't some, you know, tiny off guard. He, he was, he was a big dude and, uh, it was incredible to watch him play, but it was amazing how much the city loved him. Like when other guys would score on the Lakers, you know, the crowd would obviously applaud and, and they'd be stoked. But every time Kobe scored, the place erupted, it erupted. You know, and when I woke up to news about Kobe being gone and the way he passed away with his daughter, his poor daughter. And then you find out later on that they should be alive today. You know, that they should have never taken that helicopter. There was several, several opportunities along the way to land it, put it down. And that didn't happen didn't happen and Nipsey Hussle was taken from LA uh, Nipsey was well known around here I've been listening to Nipsey for she had probably the last eight years I didn't know other people in the country even knew Nipsey's music man <laughs> I really didn't he's just a legend around here 2020 just man it took away it took a lot away you know, took away Chad Bozeman out of the blue, Black Panther, largest grossing film of all time. What a short lived success. How sad, man. How sad. Just so many, so many incredible people. Little Richard, John Lewis. I mean, you can just go on and on and on, you know. And I just heard a few days ago that Sean Connery died. And that one hit me hard, not because Sean Connery was my favorite actor of all time, although I absolutely loved Sean Connery. But the reason that one hit me so hard is Sean Connery was my dad's favorite actor. And I lost my dad this year. And I remember Roger Moore was my favorite 007. It was just because I grew up with Roger Moore. And my daddy used to always tell me, oh, Roger Moore, he's, he's good, but he ain't no Sean Connery. And I had never seen any of the old 007 movies with Sean Connery. And, uh, you know, once we finally got a VHS player, you know, my dad started buying the old Sean Connery 007 films. And he was right. Sean Connery was the best. And uh, what a great voice. What an absolute great voice. Sean Connery had incredible actor, incredible life story, you know, and obviously you know, my father had an incredible life story. 2020 has been a year where a lot's been taken from us, starting with our way of life, right? Having to wear masks, have to stay inside. You know, people are dying of some weird bug, and no one knows what's true. You know, 2020 has been uh, the absolute death of media in, in a lot of ways because nobody knows what's true anymore. No, you can't turn on any news channel and feel as though the, the truth is there. You really have to search for it. You know, uh, I mean, is anybody else? just tired of not being able to see people smile. That's the worst part about the mask for me is just not being able to see people's faces when you talk to them. That's important, man, to see how someone feels and just the, the transfer of goodwill, a smile. 
That's what a mask blocks. It blocks a smile. You know, so... This year is almost over. And it's going to go out with a bang, you know. Tomorrow is a... Uh, it's going to get crazy with this election. It's going to get crazy for a little while afterwards. And if we don't... If we don't choose the greater good, it can get ugly in a big way. I do believe a full-on civilian civil war is certainly possible. And I just pray that we all come together and realize that is not the path that we should travel. So as we look at 2020, at everything that has been lost and taken from us, I sincerely pray that we can make 2021 a year about what we took back and what we gained and what we learned from those losses. Because the only beautiful thing about tragedy is it's an incredible, an incredible educator. So much can be learned from great loss. And we've all suffered a lot. We've all suffered a lot. So while I'm ready for 2020 to be over, I'm really excited for a chance to do it again. That's always my favorite holiday every year is the New Year's because I love the idea that you can look back and reset and say, what did we learn? And how can we do better moving forward? I've always loved that. I've always loved that. Well, we have a big opportunity as a nation to look at what we've lost and to say, how can we do better moving forward? And just to cherish those who brought us, you know, so many good memories, you know, life is short. It's short, man. And if anything, all of these losses should remind us of that. Life is short, so don't waste time caring about things that don't really matter. Find as much happiness as you can and bathe in it, man. Bathe in that happiness. And take care of each other. Take care of each other. That's one thing that I really hope 2021 re-ushers back in. The need for us to be a community you know, of togetherness. And not to be so just separated by our our thoughts and ideals, because I don't think we're all that much different, whether you're red, blue, or whether you're Mexican, white, whether you're black, Chinese, like, I just don't think people are, are <laughs> all that different, man, I think we all just want to be happy, uh, you know, to have good memories, uh, security, to have, uh, you know, a roof over our head, uh, the ability to take care of our kids, like, there are fundamental basic things that everybody you know, uh, shares and wants and needs. And I just don't think beyond that, we're all that much different from each other. So hopefully 2021 ushers back in what I think we need more than anything, which is just brotherhood, man. Brotherhood, sisterhood, fellowship, family, those fundamentals, man. We got to refine those. So. so to everybody that we lost this year and to all that we've lost, let's cherish the beauty in what's gone. And let's use that beauty to educate us moving forward. Thank you all for listening to this episode of the In a Crowded Room podcast. I'll be back tomorrow with more. All the best.